Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Health to Hold Community Resource Webinar Series. My name is Jenna Sistad, and I'm with the Ocean Mammoth Health Alliance, who are hosting today's presentation. We are a program of the Children and Family Health Institute through the VNA, and we are happy to have you with us. Thank you for joining. Uh, this month is National Minority Cancer Awareness Month, and so we have our featured speaker, Crossroads for Hope. And Jennifer is with us to take us through their presentation. Before I turn it over to Jen, I'll mention that if you can keep yourself muted until the end, that would be great. And um, we will be doing a Q&A towards the end as well. And um, we will give you a few updates at the end also. So thank you all for being here. And Jen, thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us. And I'm going to toss it over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer and I'm with Crossroads for Hope, the outreach coordinator um, over there. And um, you have to forgive my voice. <clears throat> I have um, allergies affecting me and um, just trying to make the best out of the day. So thanks Jennifer for this opportunity. And um, April, as we said, is the um, when uh, National Minority Cancer Awareness Month, and uh, we at Crossroads for Hope <coughs> believe in transforming um, the cancer experience and closing um, the cancer care gap that we um, experience in the different communities as we um, continue to expand and work in um, such communities. And as you all have um, some knowledge and experience of as you do um, the work that you do in communities. So um, we are that uh, safe space for people to turn to when they're affected by cancer. And um, our mission um, is to improve that cancer experience by reducing the burden that um, the disease has on, on people who are affected. And as we know, cancer as it is, um, affects people <clears throat> tremendously and holistically, including financially, um, physically, mentally, the whole aspect of one's um, life is affected. And uh, for those who live in communities or have backgrounds um, that um, uh, have uh, some of those um, disparities that we um, will be talking about uh, at some point today and they are adversely affected by cancer because of the other um, situations that they find themselves in. So we try to move people through um, a health crisis caused by cancer by helping them to be um, empowered with um, knowledge and this helps them to take control of their health and our well-being. And as we do this work in the community, we believe in activating individuals and families as a whole through our programs of support, connecting them to resources, the education, and giving them the hope that is required at that time when there is the cancer diagnosis in the family. And we, um, thanks to our donors, we are able to do this work at no charge to the families that are affected by cancer. The landscape that we find ourselves in for the cancer care, we see this, this um, pyramid here, we're at the top, we're having um, the search for cure for um, the disease and organizations that um, provide this um, service. We see them at the top there and trickling down, we have the um, in the middle, the organizations that are treating the cancer, like the hospitals, healthcare providers that we have working in this space. And we find ourselves here at the bottom where the community is the um, foundation. And we're working with families and our patients living with um, the disease and its um, impact. And um, we're trying to get them through and beyond um, cancer. So our model here, we have the interventions that we um, use to work persons, work alongside persons affected by cancer. So when I say affected by cancer, we're not limiting to those with a cancer diagnosis. We are also 
um, trying to support their loved ones, their caregivers, be them people who are bereaved or survivors. We um, see them as people impacted by cancer and as such um, in need for some of the psychosocial support that we uh, provide alongside their clinical um, team. So we're working with these individuals or in the community um, way up stream there, starting from the prevention there, where we're working with pre-vivors, people who have um, a stake in um, in cancer. So it could be biologically, they have um, some of those genes that make them predisposed to cancer or people who are exposed environmentally or in whatever way to, um, to cancer and trying to connect them to um, the resources starting from um, the regular screenings that people should have, understanding policies and how to apply those. And we're working them um, through uh, diagnosis, if that were the case where they experience um, a cancer diagnosis through treatment, survivorship, end of life, uh, bereavement. And um, on the screen, we see the um, interventions could be um, access to referrals that we provide or um, connecting them to other um, community organizations that can meet some of those needs. Um, decision making is um, critical when one is with um, cancer. And at some point, we see the need for um, some um, financial um, support, be it someone is affected by cancer and has to um, quit their job or has to be in the hospital and do not have um, sick pay and so on. So we meet some of those um, needs, bridging the gap between um, people falling through the cracks and so on. Okay. And um, for the emotional and social support, we have our support for families who is working with in the family setting, be it um, a pediatric um, cancer um, case or a parent having a cancer diagnosis and has um, kids in the family. We have the child life specialist um, spearheading that um, program and connecting with the family to work with them as a unit. Or it could be support through uh, oncology social workers who provide individual or group support um, to individuals um, and it's tailored to meet um, some of those needs. Others may require the individual support, others are better off working as a group um, to get um, support. Being that social connection is one of um, the needs that have been flagged in our um, um, health um, need questions. We have um, support um, to create environments where people can connect with each other, share their experiences, and reduce the isolation that's been uh, reported for people um, affected by um, cancer. So creating a community for them, be it virtual or in person, to connect and share experiences through such programs. And um, empowering them, the tools we're using here for um, behavioral change will be education and well-being, where we have a um, series of um, educational programs offered virtually or in person, covering different topics that could be beneficial for people from prevention all the way through that um, cancer continuum to uh, bereavement. And nutrition being key there, we have um, expanded on the nutrition program, getting on board the registered dietitian nutritionist, um, Hillary, who is beheading that team now, and working to um, improve um, knowledge around um, the best foods or um, ways that individuals who use nutrition to um, improve their health and uh, well-being. 
And lastly, there we have our popular mind and body programs that help to connect um, people to each other as they practice mindful pra um, practices or have some of those um, exercises that are uh, beneficial when people are affected uh, by cancer. And we can see um, a series of these um, programs on our uh, website. And as I said, they are all free of charge. So individuals are um, welcome to like join them and benefit from um, these programs that are offered by professionals at no charge. And on the last um, section there, we see our community connection and um, through the Multicultural Outreach Initiative, the um, initial program, um, Crossroads for Hope was running, had individuals affected by cancer coming to uh, Crossroads for Hope for um, support. But um, with the research showing that most minority communities have no um, awareness about um, the benefits of psychosocial support and even how to access them. Um, the public health team was brought on board to add on to the um, principles that were initially in place. And those principles were around social work, uh, social justice, and um, using um, the oncology social workers and the child life specialists. Um, and with this um, initiative now, we have the public health team being the boots on the ground out in community. And we'll see how efforts have been made to expand that reach so that we're no longer limited to um, Somerset as a county, but now out in several communities and connecting with much uh, more um, communities like the Spanish-speaking community, the Creole Haitian, um, the LGBTQ community, and um, other communities as we continue to experience throughout um, the state. Um, this model further explains what um, I talked about in the previous um, slide. So working with um, individuals and families is at the heart of it all and um, trying to um, get them to the state where we address some of those disparities and dis decrease um, the distress and um, isolations that family face. So walking them through that cancer um, health crisis and um, they do this best when they acquire the um, skills um, to gain um, support, information, resources, and um, they can um, better um, gain that confidence to um, advocate for themselves or to go to doctors and in the long run take control of um, their health and um, well-being. And in the community level, where we're seeing the increased cancer burden in the vulnerable communities. We have the um, gladiator um, partners, which will be covering under the Health Champion um, Initiative, providing that wraparound support and resources and interventions at um, community level. So empowering Health Champions to be those sustainable boots on the ground, even when we have pulled out from such um, communities. And um, in the long run, we want to normalize conversations around cancer. As we've noticed, um, cancer is still taboo or stigmatized in um, some of the communities, minority communities that we found ourselves in and um, increasing access to um, the resources and um, support within those communities that they may not be aware of and um, seeing how we can help with treatment decision-making for those who have um, a cancer diagnosis. On the other side, we have the healthcare providers where we're providing um, 
them with the um, psychosocial um, support uh, from our oncology social workers and child life specialists, being that they have this li as a limited um, resource. And we do this through the integration of the uh, my go-to support into the clinical workflows and have them um, send in persons affected by cancer to us and um, we walk them through our workflow to get the support that um, is needed from a psychosocial point of view. So we're in New Jersey and the programs that we deliver are either in person or virtual and uh, we connect directly um, to the vulnerable communities thanks to the public health and professionals on the, on the team. And we also have um, extensions nationally where we receive provider and um, self-referrals and are able to connect and provide um, interventions um, virtually. This is the COVID um, pandemic we all were able to utilize more um, virtual approaches to like meeting some of the healthcare needs that we see in community. That at least is one benefit we got on that um, period in time. So I mentioned that my go-to support as um, a no app, um, as a digital program and with this tool, we are able to connect with um, persons affected by cancer. Um, and now we have the pre-viver track that is um, being rolled out and available for use for persons who have that higher uh, predisposition to um, cancer. So not just limited to persons who have been um, impacted by cancer, but those who are worried about getting information or getting screenings or just worried in general about cancer, they can as well use this too. And it's um, operational 24 hours um, a day for seven days a week. So individuals can ac get access to um, support from the oncology social workers, uh, for the adults and then child life specialists if um, a child is involved and it produces unpersonalized um, messages that meet the members' um, experience and um, converting complex concepts into like simple step-by-step -step messages so that they are not overwhelmed by the bulk of information that is required for them to like go through, understand, um, before maybe making um, an appointment with your um, clinician, they can go through these steps, get information, and um, that will ease some of the anxiety and give them some um, questions that they could ask to um, better advocate for themselves. Um, and it looks um, like this, doesn't require an app, and the care messages um, are sent um, periodically to see how the members are um, doing. So it could be a newly diagnosed person can find um, resources in here that could help them to understand um, what's happening and what's to come or a cancer reoccurrence and so on until um, bereavement we have at the bottom there if they were to need any information, they can find it in our several care um, messages in this um, platform. Some of the um, questions that have um, been flagged up from our health needs from the communities, we see there on the screen, um, a majority of um, them expressing that lack of companionship. Um, and when we looked at that data, regardless of the um, socioeconomic status, that number uh, was from people um, having different socioeconomic status. So those earning less than um, 25,000 a year up 
to those earning over um, 200,000 a year, we're expressing that lack of um, companionship. So we can see how um, cancer is affecting um, people um, psychosocially there. And we have other needs like um, that inability to read hospital material, so health literacy being um, a problem. Um, we also have the people not being able to meet um, cost for their health care and um, others they're worried about their housing and so on. And these are some of the psychosocial needs that our clinical team um, have been working with people to um, navigate and as such um, have um, a better um, cancer experience. State-wise, we have these numbers that we all are, are familiar with for um, people um, affected by cancer. So this looks at all races, ethnicity, men um, and women. And we're seeing breast cancer on the top there, ranging down to um, pancreatic cancer at the bottom there. So these being the top 10 cancers uh, by type in New Jersey, um, we have the number of deaths across New Jersey for all um, races, ethnicities, um, across all um, gender there for lung cancer leading um, the chart for, um, for deaths, um, whereas we had the breast cancer like having more um, incidents. Given these numbers, we want to zoom in on the minority communities and see how they are adversely affected. And uh, we see the role that social determinants of health um, plays in um, exacerbating the um, disparities that we see in the um, cancer um, experience that people have. So for cancer incidence and mortality overall, we've seen that um, general decline um, in the country. However, for these um, groups, um, which are predominantly the minority groups, we have that um, increased risk of developing or um, increase in death from um, certain cancers. So take for example there for most common cancers like the breast, the lung, the prostate, and the rectal cancers, we're seeing incidents of um, death rates being higher in African American, um, African Americans um, compared to other racial or ethnic groups. And um, we have also highlighted there for the Hispanic, Latino, and Black American, African American women, we're having higher rates of cervical um, cancers than women of other rates. And um, we see there the American Indian, Alaska natives um, having the higher um, death rates of um, kidney cancers. Uh, we're seeing some of the risk factors. Um, more in um, youths um, who are like um, lesbians or, or gay and um, bisexuals um, compared to the heterosexual um, youths. So these disparities show us that um, the cancer experience is being felt differently um, or experienced differently in the minority groups and um, than um, in their um, counterpart um, communities. So the um, all um, the, the cancer has um, a significant psychosocial impact on a person and their families and it is much more like magnified in these vulnerable communities that we have identified as the minority um, communities that we um, have been 
um, working with and providing um, services um, to some of the <clears throat> challenges or barriers that we've seen out there in research and also from the work that we're doing. We have the, the fear or lack of trust, um, cultural um, barriers there. Uh, we know the, the history in the health um, system of the country and how individuals from minority um, groups um, are just generally um, mistrusting of um, the, the system and the such building um, that trust again and um, connecting with these communities using persons who are from the community um, to connect with those communities can improve that um, trust and um, get um, persons from these groups to like reconnect with the system to get um, the treatment or the health care that um, they need. Um, these disparities also are seen in the recruitment and participation in clinical trials in communities of color and as such the results that we have from clinical trials at the moment do not necessarily apply to the uh, minority communities. So more work will need to be done in this aspect as well to get the people in the communities where we serve to like um, get access to um, clinical trials, be involved there so that the results that we have is not um, just from um, individuals who are not representatives of the minority groups and as such those results can um, be used to like improve um, the cancer experience in these minority groups and in Altogether, we see that these disparities result in a late stage um, diagnosis and a such higher incidence of um, mortalities in these communities of um, color, as was mentioned um, in the previous slide. So from the National Cancer Institute, I saw this and um, I just wanted to share it with us. Um, it says eliminating some cancer disparities in the pursuit of health equity will require policy changes to overcome systemic social, racial, and or institutional inequalities. From our, <clears throat> from our own end at Crossroads for Hope, we are having as a result of uh, what we're seeing in research and the work that we've been doing, the experience that we've had so far for the 20 something years that um, Crossroads for Hope has been in, um, in the field. Our work is now being embedded in communities as far upstream as possible, even before we are needed. So individuals just worried about the word cancer. We are looking to like empower them with information and the resources that they need and work with individuals through the whole experience. And in the communities, for the programs to be more sustainable, we are mobilizing the health champions to act as first responders in key vulnerable communities. And this will help close that cancer care gap that uh, we're experiencing. So um, these partnerships were developing through our public health team and trying to connect and engage community members like yourself. So forgive me for the <laughs> series of emails I've been sending out regarding this. And um, we're trying to use your support to like get identify individuals in communities that can become these health champions to, um, so they can receive um, these skills or the, the, the social work and um, child life uh, team can transfer 
um, some of the skills required for them to be the best responders out there so that we can bridge that gap, reduce um, the time lag from uh, one being worried about cancer to one getting the service that it requires. So <clears throat> that baseline was um, to normalize conversations around cancer and um, we we'll see there embedded in the program, the clinical trials where we have the diversity matters um, initiative there, trying to increase the numbers of uh, minority groups that are involved in um, clinical trials. The health service um, area framework is what we use to design um, this approach. So looking across New Jersey, we have the HSAs that have um, higher cancer incidences there towards the um, top and compare that to the next column there where we have the cancer incidence for the Black and Hispanic groups and the health um, HSA um, counties there and the priority communities that we um, are expanding into. For now, we are in um, Middlesex. We started out in Union County and um, expanded to uh, Middlesex. Um, Somerset, of course, being our home office space. So we, we were there um, and now rolling out into Essex, Hudson, Bergen, um, Passaic, and I'm down here in um, Ocean Mama um, counties, um, Mesa there at the bottom and part of um, Hunterdon. So plans on the way to continue to roll out so we can cover all the HSAs and see how we can um, apply these principles of um, social work, child life specialist, um, public health and um, nutrition in mitigating some of the um, disparities that we see um, out there in the minority um, communities. So this is um, just um, clips from um, our outreach, um, one of our days out there in the community, I believe it was in Plainfield and um, over here it's in um, Elizabeth, where mm -hmm. Siklali and myself are the public health um, professionals on the team, um, relying on the support from interns across the state to be boots on the ground for now, pending when we fully activate these health champions in like each of these communities that we're finding ourselves in. The ways to connect um, minority communities um, to support, I have that on the screen there, our phone number, um, email and the website where people can um, connect to support um, and also um, using the my go to support um, program um, where they can um, sign up themselves or through the help of um, healthcare professionals that like yourself to the programs um, that we offer and just partnering with us to like identify members in communities who can become health champions for those communities. And with that, I've come to the end. Um, and any questions? Thank you, Jenna, for having me. Thank you, Jen. Um, I see so many people writing things into the chat. So I'm going to just read a couple of comments as you are presenting things are coming in as folks are thinking of some questions that they may have for you. Um, we have someone that says this is an excellent model that could be used as a template to address other healthcare diagnosis and subsequent management. 
Somebody else says, great way of assessing patient barriers. And that when you were talking about um, screening increases makes sense. Great to see incidents decline as screening increases. So I think people were really engaged in your presentation, Jen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, now would be a great time if anybody, oh, Karen just writes something else. Amazing presentation today. Thank you kindly. There are so many commonalities and similarities with regard to the mental health and social experiences with other mental health related diagnosis in her professional experience. The well care model could be used in these situations. I like how there's a path of hope and support in the spirit of collaboration. Well said, Karen. Thank you for saying that. Um, Kelsey says, thank you for all this great information, Jen. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, now would be a good time for folks to put questions into the chat if you have them or it's a manageable group today. So if you want to take yourself off mute and ask Jen directly, that would be great as well. So we'll just open up for that. All right, you guys know that I always have questions. So I'm gonna jump in and, and ask. Um, first of all, I think the my go-to support is very, very cool. I just shared that with somebody who asked me for something very similar yesterday. So thank you for that. Then we talked about the Health Champion Workshop. Um, Jen and I were kind of offline talking about it and I haven't really been able to finalize dates or times or anything like that, because I figured maybe we could talk today or open it up to this group that if anybody has interest in joining the health champion workshop, that that's something that our coalition will be able to set up with Jen and invite you all to join us for. I know that Jen is more recently newer to Ocean and Monmouth County. They're looking to get acquainted with more partners here and do more in the community. So this might be a great way to kind of bridge those gaps um, I, I remember, Jen, you said, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a three-hour training. Is that right? Yes. So for um, the group here, we're believing that they have some knowledge about um, cancer because the module starts with cancer education. So for lay persons, of course, it's going to take the three hours. But for persons with that um, knowledge about cancer, it's going to take less because we'll be going over um, the oncology, social work, and child life um, specialist um, modules um, okay. and not from scratch. So about yeah. two hours for professionals. Okay, two hours. I would say that the two hours is probably the right amount of time for this group that we'd be offering to here today. Um, many of them have a baseline of, of the topic. So yeah. Um, so folks, if you have interest in this, please either put it into the chat right now, or you could shoot me an email offline, um, just so that we can get a sense of who would be interested in setting something like this up with us. We, um, I remember, Jen, you said between 10 and 20 participants to actually get it going, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, we would need to know who's really interested and committed for this before we go forward setting it up. Yeah. For now, I have um, some updates. They're running um, one up there in um, Bedminster, Somerset County, for um, the community up there. And anyone who like can make it up there, they're well, more than welcome to attend. Um, because other people have been expressing they would like to experience it before bringing it to their community. But we have that um accommodation to like come out to the different um counties that we found ourselves in to give the workshops and um the coordination would be much much um appreciated. Thank you. Um, Mariella, the, the presentation would be in person. Um, we did talk about the option of doing virtual, but right now Crossroads is only offering it in person at this time. That's a good question. Thank you for saying that. I forgot to mention that. So we'd probably um, post somewhere in Freehold or Lakewood or somewhere in between so that folks from both Mammoth and Ocean could have the opportunity to join. Cheryl, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. You could take yourself off mute. Yes. Hello. Um, I just have a quick, simple question. I know for Jen, um, I know she had mentioned during the presentation that some of the, the cancer can be environmental. Have they pinpointed down just to like local people 
like what type of environmental factors can it be so that we can be more aware of our lifestyles? So we um looking at the research um out there and the work that um the environmental um team from Rutgers are um doing and the Department of Environment, some um carcinogenic materials in the environment have um well I said that there's been an association with those. Like we had the the nine eleven incidents where um, a lot of pollution was in the air, and we have seen that increased um, numbers of cancer incidents amongst people who were in that environment. And as such, the there've been um, a follow up with them to see how uh, most of them became um, diagnosed with cancer. So the those are like that would be like a large cohort of environmental exposures that led people to um, to um, cancer diagnosis. And then we have some other um, pockets of um, incidents. There was um, a lead pollution up in Newark there, and they're also being followed and um, um, being a cohort to be studied to see, you know, how that um, can affect their um, predisposition to um, to cancer. So for now, those are some of the, like say, the concrete ones that we know of, but of course there are a lot of um, whistleblowers out there um, about um, pesticides that um, have been used from time to time, you know, and, um, and so on. So we see a lot on um, the internet, but of course we have to back that up with um, research from credible sources. Okay, I appreciate that. So you're saying it's more so really external factors other than being like a self-induced, like something like specifically with our lifestyle or what we're taking in or something like that. So it's mostly that we're ex just exposed to different things in the environment externally. Yeah, that are considered, um, you know, carcinogenic um, agents. Okay. All righty. Thank you. And I know we have some of our health department partners here. So if anybody else has some things to add to that answer, we would welcome that as well. Mariella, yes to your to your side message. Yes, we can share more information about this training if others that you know have interest. Thank you, Jenna. You're welcome. Yeah. I'm glad and to see your name. We miss you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, um, Chris, Krista so, asks, yeah. can you talk a little bit more about the course? Um that we missed a little bit of the background. Um, so Jen offered us a health champion workshop. She says that for this particular group, because we're service providers with some baseline information about cancer, that two hours in person would be appropriate. And this um, training is free to professionals on how to support people in the community going through a cancer diagnosis and to connect them to psychosocial supports and other resources. Uh, in a timely manner. I, I don't know if Jen, you had any more to add on that, but that was just, I just re literally read from Jen's email to me when we first started the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you sound like um, someone who developed the whole <laughs> nope, issue. Nope, those were your words, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know, maybe the next step will be like to share that um the flyer. The, yeah, that link, the registration um uh, interest registration form with the group and people who are interested or know someone interested can just register them so we can begin to have counts. And um I spoke with um Catherine, who's our senior director of program. And um, the one who is um, designing, um, has designed and it's um, rolling out the program, I explained how <clears throat> ocean and mammoth are kind of, um, you know, um, ways um, apart. And if we can have um, those workshops, one out there in um, Lakewood and then one out here in um, closer, like in um, Freehold, um, 
that will be like more beneficial like have than having people move from you know ocean to mom uh or from mom to ocean okay that works. And um, right now I just emailed to the folks who said that they would be interested or had questions. I just emailed them the flyer. So that would be a way to learn a little bit more about it. And then Ocean Mammoth Health Alliance could set it up so that, you know, Jen and I work directly together, but then we invite all of you as our partners to attend. Any other questions for Jen today? Okay. I just wanted to ask one more thing, Jen, can you talk a little bit about your, um, under your nutrition pillar, you had um, talked with us about doing food boxes. Um, so in Lakewood on May 1st and May 8th, we're doing a two-part HPV film at the Lakewood library and Jen's team will be there to provide resources and support and also um, some food boxes with their nutrition uh, initiative. So Jen, can you talk a little bit more about that? Okay. So for um the nutrition program, um evaluations were showing how people were worried about um their nutrition and the role nutrition was playing, you know, in their health and well being. So um Crossroads for Hope has um got some grants, got on board the RDN, um, Hillary, and then partnering with um, the, the food box people at um, Common Market as well. Um, and um, we have the program where they deliver the food boxes to attendees at different um, locations. And then the RDN provides like um, a nutrition education um, around cancer. So it could be something like um, how nutrition can improve your um, outcomes or help prevent, you know, um, certain uh, digestive um, issues and so on. So um, the program has the food box um, distribution and that um, educational component um, to it. So for the one in, um, in Lakewood on the first, we um, are looking to see how the food boxes will be delivered um, down there. And apparently they've never made um, distributions to, to Ocean County. So um, we're trying to walk around and having the food boxes delivered in time for um, the Wednesday, even though they said um, they can make the, the distribution on a Tuesday and uh, we'll need room to like keep the boxes for um, the Wednesday where the event is um, taking place. And um, Marlene is um, working to like get that um, sorted out. And for the presentations, um, because of the, um, well, I say the limited time that we have for the registered dietitian nutritionist to um, cover um, her talk points, um, we have decided for her to like make um ten minutes educational clips that are um interactive and um covering the topic for um the day, which is like um HPV and trying to connect that to um to nutrition or nutrition trying to connect it to um HPV. So she'll be making um those videos and sending them out and hopefully we'll have one played uh one 10 minutes one played the first day and this follow-up 10 minutes one played on the eight and uh we'll be out there also with the um cancer psychosocial um support materials to like give out and give whatever um education that people may need to connect to support. Wonderful. Thank you. We're looking forward. We're looking forward to that. And it's so wonderful that you have that component built into your programming, because like you mentioned before about the social determinants, everything is connected. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions for Jen? Okay. Jen, I thank you again for, for presenting with us today. We all learned a lot. We can definitely touch base about the health champion training. And um, I would just like to take this time to give a few updates on behalf of Ocean Mammoth Health Alliance. 
Um, as I mentioned, we have on May 1st and May 8th, the two-part HPV video film. Um, we'll be watching that at Lakewood Library together in the evening, 6.30 to 10. Um, on May 4th, we have a women's health event happening at Casa Freehold. We'll have a lot of really fun things happening and a lot of educational things as well. So the Freehold Area Health Department will be there doing lead testing and providing education. We have Centro State coming out to do A1Cs and blood pressures. We have BNA coming out to do vaccines. Um, the SEED team will be there to do demonstrations of self-breast exams. So um, that's going to be a great day. It's going to be 10 to 1. If you can come out, please do. Let us know if you'd like to exhibit. We're just finalizing details for that. We'll have a mobile food pantry on site and be giving away um, some take-home bags for families who are in need of meals. Um, May 22nd is our next Our Health to Hold at 10 a.m. We'll have the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey team presenting with us and it is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. So that's what we will be highlighting there. Um, in between on, I wanna say May 21st at 10 a.m. we have Dr. Larry A. coming in to do a webinar with us on gut brain connection. And so um, we're really excited about that. I'll be sharing that flyer with the whole coalition team today. So lots happening. We hope you can make it to some of our uh, upcoming initiatives. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you everybody for coming and that concludes our session today.